One story and you guys can ask whatever questions you want. I'll give you a, a, a simple human understanding of what fearing Hashem means to someone that lived among us, walked among us, not too long ago. One of the Gdolei Ado, his name was Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. It's well known that Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, when he prayed Amida, unlike what you see in Batek Neset today, where you see sometimes people are like breakdancing when they're praying. They go like this, like that, they're moving. It's like, yeah, and they start dancing sometimes. One time I went to a, uh, to a Bekneset for uh, Oshana Raba. We had a nine-hour shiu, nine-hour shiu. After nine hours of speaking straight, you're kind of tired. You're kind of tired. Oh, but I went to the right keila. They wanted to have shachrit, four hours shachrit. Four hours shachrit. Why? Because they wanted to dance the whole time. Not a single one of them came to the shiur to other. But dancing for four hours, they want for shachrit. So people think that if you dance in shachrit, that makes you holy. No, it just makes you dance. It doesn't make you holy. You're a good dancer. Maybe you uh, get a job from Adana or something. But in Shemaim, they're not going to hire you. Why? They don't need dancers in Shemaim. They need tzaddikim in Shemaim. Now, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Dol Ador, Yad Ruch HaKodesh. When he prayed, it was very well known that he literally stood like a pillar. Didn't move an inch, not right, not left, not front, not back, nothing. Like so much so that it was weird to everyone else. It was just, how do you not move at all? Like nothing, not even like, you know, like sometimes you look around a little bit, you finish, or, or you just, you know, you move a little, like something, something. You know, even if you don't want to move, you move. Almost like a, a little fire is in you, and you start, you know, when the fire is dancing a little bit. Right? Nothing. Zero. Stands like a pillar, like he's made out of cement. So one time, one of the people in the kila says, Kvodarav, please tell us, uh, why don't you move? You should know, based on Alakha, based on Alakha, you're really not supposed to move during Amida. You could see actually in uh, the Stechemed, also Tfilah de Moshe, Rav Moshe Levi, both wrote it, wrote it that if you're going to move, if you're going to go back and forth, only do it during the other prayers. Don't move during Amida. Don't do it during Amida. Why? You're in front of the Melech Malchem Lachim at the most serious time. It's not a time for dancing. So they asked Rav Moshe Feinstein, Kvod Rav, how come you don't move? He says, when I was in Russia, one time these Kozaks, these Rashaim, wicked, put a gun to my head. And he said, if you move, I'm going to kill you. And I was young at the time. But when he put that gun to my head, I was so scared that he was going to kill me for nothing. I didn't do anything. Just for moving. Just twitch, right? Or if something itched. Not like I'm walking or running away. If I simply scratched my forehead, he was going to kill me. He was dead serious about killing me. It wasn't a joke. He was just looking for an excuse to kill me. That fear that I had made me realize how insignificant I am. How much of a zero I am. And at that moment, I said, this insignificance, this zeroness, I must dedicate this to Hashem. I must dedicate this to Hashem the rest of my life. And that's why every time I meet Hashem, every time I pray, that's why I pray. Because He put a gun to my head. He's flesh and blood. Worst case scenario, I die. Big deal. But I was scared I didn't move. I didn't move. How would I not be scared if I'm meeting a Kadosh Baruch Hu? Many of the tzaddikim prayed very differently than the way you see in shuls. Why? The more Torah you know, the more you understand you have to be a little bit different. Different doesn't mean you make a scene. Different doesn't mean you are the loud, loudest voice. Different means that you're the one that sees what a Kadosh Baruch Hu says and sticks to it. Today it's different, unfortunately. But I promise you that the more different you are from everybody else around you, as far as complying with the Torah, the more you'll influence everyone around you to be different, just like you. 
the kedusha that you bring to the place will influence them much more than you trying to be just like them and fit in. That's what a lot of young rabbis make a mistake in doing. They try to appease the crowd by telling people what they want to hear. They soften the approach. They start telling you about Yirat Shamaim in such a nice way that you forget you're afraid. There's an article on the internet by Chabad about Geenom. After I wrote it, I told them, I wrote them, I want to go there. How you portray Geenom, I want to go there. This approach that happened in our generation, unfortunately, is confusing a lot of people. It's very important to know that we have our Torah, we have our tzaddikim that tell us exactly what this means, what that means, what this means, what that means, and that's what we follow. We don't follow any local rabbi, we don't follow any famous speaker, we're not looking to be motivated into some type of state of numbness, thinking that we're tzaddikim. If you're alive, that's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying constantly, my son, my daughter, you have work to do. That's why you're alive. It begins with Yilat Shamayim, you start having Emunah, you start having Bitachon, you combine all three different pieces, and little by little you get closer and closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and fulfilling your mission in the world. But if you think that you could just pick apart whichever pieces you like, you're going to love Hashem sometimes, you're going to believe sometimes. Once in a blue moon, when a car is approaching you, you're going to be afraid. But if it's not approaching, then it's okay. You're going to, you're, you're, your Yerat Shemaim will go on vacation. You know, you start picking and choosing which mitzvot you have, it's not going to fare very well. And that's why I always tell people, Yerat Hashem, Iyot It's written in the Torah. Fear of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, that's my treasure. So the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says, what does it mean that's his treasure? Chachamim say he created the entire world just for you to be afraid of him. Not for you to love him. For you to be afraid of him. You should love him. It's a mitzvah. But it's not possible if you don't fear him first. Meaning that if you are only afraid of him, it's perfectly fine. Why? It's still a connection to him. But if you think you could only love him, it's not a connection to him. It's a connection to something else. It's not him. Why? If you know him, if you know HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you must be afraid. So it's either fear or fear and love. It can never be just love. And that's what Rabbi Akiva gave us as a chidush. We thought, oh, maybe we could skip. Skip the fear part. Go to the party. But that's the the reason why is because most of us don't even know what it means to to love Hashem. We think that loving Hashem is, uh, you know, something uh, nice. Like we love our wives, we love our husbands, you know, puchi, muchi, muchi. It's not that. That's not Hashem. Hashem. Hashem is not a puppy. A small example of what loving Hashem is, is in this Tanakh that I opened right at the beginning of the lecture. And I said, I can't believe I opened it over here because the whole idea of the lecture is in this one verse. The whole idea, the whole verse, the whole lecture of what I just told you is in this one verse. Hashem doesn't need three hours. He needs just one verse. And even this one verse, you could elaborate it for 500 years. The prophet Job says in chapter chapter 13, verse 15, were he to kill me, I would still yearn for him. Job is saying, even if HaKadosh Baruch Hu kills me, destroys me, punishes me, hurts me, all that stuff, all the worst things you could possibly imagine, I'll still do everything he says. Why? He's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And even for this high level there's a debate in the Gemara of whether this is the highest level of fear or the beginning of love. But it's definitely not the highest level of love. We're thinking in our mind, wow, this guy loves Hashem. Even if he's going to kill you, you're going to still serve him? You, you're, you fell in love with Hashem. Wow, Chazak Ubaruch, Job. No, no. There's actually a machloket between two Tanaim. One says, yeah, he loves him. That one says, ah, I'm love. Are you crazy love? No. He got to the highest level of fear. That's what he got to. He's not loving him yet. Meaning that the highest level of fear is the beginning of loving Hashem. Needless to say, most people in our generation simply do not even understand the basic definition of what it means to love Hashem. Loving Hashem simply means you have no interest in yourself anymore. You have Hashem's interest only. You only care about what Hashem wants. That's loving Hashem. You're not doing anything for a reward. 
Meaning, even if Hashem says, listen, you keep Shabbat, I'm going to punish you. But you have to keep Shabbat. But I'm going to punish you for every single time you keep Shabbat, I'm going to punish you. And you still keep Shabbat. That's loving Hashem. How many people you have in there? Even Rabbi Nachman Breslev. Rabbi Nachman Breslev said it himself in uh, Likutei Ma'aran. He says, Alvai my generation of tzaddikim all reach Yirat Shemayim. He said it himself. So this, why, this is why we constantly talk about Yirat Shemayim. Because quite frankly, from experience and from the books, Talking about Avat Hashem is really irrelevant for most people at this stage. If you have arrived at a point where you can fall in love with Hashem and have fear of Hashem, most likely you are teaching. You're not learning from me anymore. You're already, well, Hashem, maybe I can learn from you. You're not learning from me. I'll I can learn from you. 